Hello and welcome to the MBS Show, episode number 105. I am your host, Norman Sanzo. Joining me today is James Cork. Hey, Norman. How are you, everybody? Hey, James. How are you doing, man? Uh, hanging there. Can't complain. I heard that you're going to Buck. Yes. If everything goes well, I will be confirmed to go to Buck this year. That's wonderful, isn't it? Yes, I know. I am going to Buck too. I just need a hotel and a plane ticket and also a Buck County kit. But I'm going. Yay! You're getting there. You're going to get there. We're going to get you there. Yeah. And also joining us today is guest host, Sketchy Sounds. Hello, hello. I'm back again. You just can't keep me away, it seems. Oh, yes, indeed. And also, um, if I remember right, you're going to Buck 2, right? Well, considering that I have already got my hotel booked, and considering that I run their Tumblr, and considering that I'd probably be performing... I think if I didn't turn up, they'd be just a little bit upset with me. <laughs> and also, if I'm not mistaken, Hazel Hoovis is joining you, right? And Hazel Hoovis is in the call too. Hazel. Hey, Norman. Hi, James. Hey, Sketchy again. And Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Second week running, I'm running on this thing. Lovely. Yay, this is <laughs> awesome. So you're going to Buck too, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. We've got the tickets for our hotel, which is <laughs> the Britannia Hotel. Ah... <laughs> <laughs> uh... The Britannia Hotel. Uh, Britannia's going to have a field day with that. (laughs) (laughs) You British are so punny. (laughs) See, here's the thing. Um, Me and Hazel and my flatmate are all going to be staying in one room at the Britannia. Um, But yeah, Hazel's almost obligated to go for similar reasons to the ones I'm going, because he is, of course, the, uh, the main artist for Ask Britannia. So... Like me, he's basically going to be getting in free because of that, because we are practically staff, so. Plus, I've done the first two years uh, running, so it'd be a bit much to miss out on the third year as well. Mm. <laughs> exactly. So you guys are obligated then. All righty then. Obligated and entirely voluntary as well <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> okie dokie yeah. dokie. wanting to go. <laughs> so anyway, guys, let's move on to the next topic. The next topic is housekeeping. Just like last year, we have an award for you guys to vote for. Pick the best out of the best and vote for your favorite personalities. Links can be found in the show notes. So if you like any one of these two, James and Sketchy, sorry, not you, Hazel, you just came in this year, so next year. Way to be rude, no? Next year. He he will have a (laughs) slot for next year. But um, if you like James and Sketchy, do vote for them and make sure they win. (laughs) And if you want to vote for most root personality, vote for Norman. <laughs> I don't think so. We have that one yet. Uh, no, he's got a lot of competition with some of the American uh, <laughs> podcasts. Right? Oh, oh, no, they, no, you know what? They all get disqualified because they, that's taking advantage. <laughs> oh, shot fired. But anyway, let's move on to the next topic. The next topic is news time. In today's news time, new McDonald pony figures on the way, maybe? Yep, they're on their way. Rumors have been floating around that McDonald's are going to have another batch of pony toys. A vinyl scratch figure resembling the McDonald's pony toys have been popping up on Taobao and various other places. Upon further investigation, it is confirmed that McDonald's will be having a new batch of pony toys. The pony toys coincide with the Rainbow Power toys and they are eight ponies available. They will be available starting from March 28th through April 24th. So guys, they are out. They are going to be out. And they have Luna, they have Celestia, and they have Princess Twilight Sparkle. <clears throat> yeah, but they don't have Applejack. Also, get ready for people doing videos of uh, themselves playing with the toys in McDonald's, making everything very awkward. And, oh, God, cringe, cringe, worthy. Oh, James, uh, you, you want an awkward mm. moment? Try this. Going to McDonald's, ordering a McValue, and saying to the cashier, Oh, can I have uh, the Happy Meal toy? And the cashier says, which one? The guy toy? No, no, just the girl toy. And, yeah, playing poker face. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure about you guys. In, in my place, I didn't have that much problem getting the... I didn't... The, the, both the McDonald's, the first ones, and the Burger King ones. So, I guess it depends on the place. And how you say it. Well, in this country, we never even had the My Little Pony toys. And uh, I should know, really? I work for them. Oh, really? So, uh, yeah, yeah, I work for McDonald's. I get a discount and all that kind of stuff. So, 
And you guys never got the toys? No, they never run My Little Pony. Um, as far as Hasbro are concerned, the country of the United Kingdom exists in a mystery fantasy realm. We don't even get the show on TV, or at least they try <laughs> to. <laughs> you know, you don't get the show on TV, but they rip off your idea of a royal wedding to make an episode. <laughs> yep. Oh, uh, boys. Welcome to being a, uh, a cultural export, but being too expensive to actually ship anything. I well, don't you see, they are, that, that's, that's a payback for trying to take them back in the, in the independent war. <laughs> that, to be honest, you think they get over it. You think they got a good thing out of that deal. So I don't know why they're... Uh... What, are you kidding? No. They're still making movies about the Vietnam War. Do you think they're going to let go of the, the, the secession war? I don't think so. <laughs> Uh, oh but no, unfortunately, we didn't get uh, McDonald's pony toys. Oh, yeah. We have to we have to buy them from uh, from those willing to sell them on eBay and the like. Though you yeah. know, I I could have a look into it and see if we might be getting this run of uh, of MLP toys hope for so. a chain. You so. know, hope so because if not, I I am willing to sell them. <laughs> it's just I'm not mass- selling mine. <laughs> I'm going to buy more than one. That's the thing. But James and guys, do share your opinions for the toys because I saw the rarity one and it looks cool. I they have Rainbow Fire. Oh, sorry. I was just saying I haven't really seen them yet. I mean, I have seen one or two pictures, and yeah, as, as James said, they're they're fitting in with the Rainbow Power stuff. You know, <laughs> side note to that, I'm looking forward to seeing that because I'm sorry, but Rainbow Power Rainbow Dash just looks <laughs> like this is in my final form. <laughs> <laughs> they all they all got turned into gone Super Saiyans. Saiyan yeah, Rainbow Dash especially looks like she's gone Super Saiyan level 3. Curse you, k k k carrot cake. <laughs> You're not <laughs> real Super <laughs> Saiyan. <laughs> uh, but still, but still, the, the toys looks awesome and I can't wait. And Hazel, you were saying something? Oh, no, no, I was just... <laughs> I was just laughing at the whole thing. And I'm actually looking up what kind of different uh, MLP toys have been released over the years <laughs> via um, McDonald's. And yeah, yeah. Just to see if there, we do we do happen to be getting it in the UK. And uh, no, it doesn't look like there's any sign of it. Oh. But when you take into account that the show isn't even shown over here, it's somewhat understandable. But um, That's kind of weird because if you, if you think about it, it's already in English. It will be like, like exporting that like no one's business. All I can presume is it's some sort of, uh, some sort of legal issue maybe with who they can uh, actually market the show with because um, they did have it on Boomerang, which is a channel we had uh, mm. over here. At least they, they showed parts of season one and some of season two or something. But um, I wasn't really all that concerned because, one, I, I didn't have the kind of cable networks that could run Boomerang, and two, I have YouTube before well, Hasbro started cracking down on, on MLP on YouTube. You have the streams and you can watch it live. This is kind of mm. why I think that cable TV is on its last legs in this day and age. Because you can go to the internet to get the shows that you want to watch. Yep, from Hulu or whatever. It's translating to a different medium and, yeah, it does mean quite a lot of television and what people would, you know. But there's still a good number of people who don't go turn to the internet immediately for the internet, uh, for videos and so forth. So, you know, that's where... I am really am quite shocked that something of the quality of, uh, of MLP never made it on to say, you know, British terrestrial television onto the BBC or ITV or any other the sort of channels that do have kids programming still as part of their lineup. Well, Hazel, it could be because of the licensing where a certain mm. company is supposed to buy the whole um, slot but isn't affordable or it, they can't afford it or anything like that. But anyway, um, let's move on to the next topic. From your TV entertainment, let's move on to card game entertainment. And Celestia and Luna CCG team decks are on their way. If you haven't gotten the MLP CCG decks yet, here's a good time to get them. Interplay recently announced their new team decks for the Scantalot Knight set. The ponies that will be featured are Princess Celestia and Princess Luna. Expect them to be available in April. Things can be found in the show notes. So, any of you guys played this game yet? No, I haven't. (laughs) Not much of a card gamer, I'm afraid. Uh. Um, I spent too much money on Magic the Gathering to uh, to spend more money on another collectible card game. And to be honest with you, Magic the Gathering is good and easy enough. And it has really cool illustrations. From what I saw, uh, the MLP card game, it's ridiculously complicated. Um, well, technically, it's... Um, how do I put this? 
it's hard to get in, but once you get it running, it's really simple. But yeah, I, I, it's understandable. And then once you get in, there's no escape. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is true. That is so. There is true. no exit. There is no exit. <laughs> that is so true. I well, kind of a circle. All these <laughs> as make a circle. <laughs> I managed to. How do I put this? I managed to infect some friends with the card game, and they're buying their own now. Mmm. And to infect them with it. <laughs> Norman, the word, the, the verb that you use, infect, that kind of describes the whole thing about this fandom. Yes, it's infectious. Indeed. Mm. Oh, talking about magic, today I played a magic game with a really good system, um, hard mode. You know that? No, not really, actually. There is a hard mode for Magic the Gathering? No, hard. Oh, Horde. No, I had no idea. It's for the Born of Gods, uh, Born of God set. But, you know, we, this is not a Magic, Magic the Gathering podcast. Yeah, we're kind of like streaming out of topic here. Let's <laughs> write it back to, to where it was. I know, just filling up time. And moving on to the last news, uh, this is going to be a really happy one. Michael Marone's health is greatly improving. It's been three months since the incident, and Michael Marone's health has been steadily improving. Recently, in a tweet by Michael Marone's parents... He has awakened and is making much progress. Included in the tweet is a video showing his current state, which shows that while he has some muscle problems, he apparently can see all right and understand commands. Links can be found in the show notes. So this is amazing, guys. Yeah, that's good news. It's wonderful. That's good news. You know, an interesting oh, thing. Um, I was just going to clear something that uh, was kind of serendipitous about this. Um, on the... On pretty much the same day that the news hit that uh, he'd woken up, I actually got from... There was a thing that uh, T-Villain did, the, uh, that, that, uh, the T-shirt company that um, sells like T-shirts for like, a limited time with various designs. They did one in support of Michael Rones, and I got one of those, and it arrived on the day that they'd said he'd woken up. Oh, that's cool. So it was like right as, right as I got that and I was reminded of... I had bought it, the uh, the news came in that he'd woken up as so well. I was like, that was some really good timing. Timing! The doctors are using the term nothing sort of a medical miracle. When the doctors say that, you know that means something. Mm -hmm. It's uh. wonderful to see that this kid is recovering. I, be, I have been unable to see the video, uh, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to start uh, start pulling at, the, uh, at that because it's so good. It's so wonderful to see him recovering and getting better. Mm -hmm, that is true, that is true. L looking at him with the video, him playing with the iPad. I mean, in reality, looking at that video is basically nothing. It's just a kid having trouble playing with the iPad. But knowing his backstory makes a lot more sense and it makes you feel more for it. I think it, what's most interesting about this this whole debacle is that, I mean, concerning him, I mean, the the fact that it was brought about through through bullying and just the way that you said it there, uh, Norman, saying, you know, you don't think of it until you know the backstory behind it. And I think there's a lot of that that goes on in the world. You get so inundated with it over the internet with, you know, so many other people, so many people's problems and, you know, reports of people being, you know, coming to tragic situations like this that you just feel somewhat, you know, you just feel washed out by it. So you almost get to a point of apathy, but... You know, yeah, you're overloaded is... with it, and it doesn't phase you anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it almost becomes a case of this is the way the world is. But the wonderful thing about this is how many people have pulled together over it. And admittedly, they've done so, you know, through the unity of the fandom. It makes you wonder, would they be so, you know, would they be so glad to do so if it was just, you know, any other sort of, um, that, you know, child in the same sort of situation. But um, it's it's... It's heartening about human nature, and it's heartening about hearing about when you hear s certain bad things about our fandom, or indeed any other fandom, but it's still full of so many good people who will go out of their way and put so much of their effort into helping someone. Well, and you know that you know that every every fandom has its good side and the bad, but the bad side. But usually, the good side stays quiet and doing good things, while the bad side is kind of bashing its head against the wall and making a ruckus. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the point. You talk about them being the bad side purely and simply because, compared to what mo normal behavior is, it is bad. I mean, no one talks about normal behavior and say, "Oh, it's extraordinary that we've done all this wonderful stuff that often," because y you're kind of expected to. It's part and parcel yeah. of being a, a human being that you're supposed to be good. 
you know. Well, so, so I, I think the proper phrase was to be a like-minded human being, at least civil mm-hmm. or at least with a brain. Yes. <laughs> But but still, but still, this this is the feel good news. And congratulations, Michael. We knew it. You could do it. And bam, you're there now. Get better and listen to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna have a lot of episodes to catch up with. You're gonna have so much fun seeing the show. Yep. It's going to be wonderful. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you're gonna go to conventions, and you're going to be welcomed with the biggest, most roaring applause. Yeah, you're gonna be a hero, man. Yeah. You're going to be a role model. You're going to be an example of uh, how it is to uh, uh, put up with those terrible people and being able to pull through and and just proving that there is something better than what you have right now waiting for you. Mm-hmm. To be fair, I think he, uh, the uh, the best thing he can do at the moment is just, yeah, get back to living. <laughs> get yeah. back to experiencing things again. Yeah, true, true. you you got a lot to catch up, man, because... Within the three months, there have been almost a few episodes out. So do catch up on that. Catch up with school, catch up with your friends, all of that. I'm really yeah. sure they will be happy to see you back. Oh, yeah. And also, um, message Tara Strong. I bet she would love it. <laughs> but anywho, talking about the good side and bad side. Well, we don't have a guest, so it's going to be topic time. So in today's topic time, we are going to talk about head cannons. Will it help? us develop more ideas for the show or will it hinder us for the show and we have head canon expert Hazel Hoof. Hey Hazel, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, thank you but uh, I do find it really odd that you use the term head canon expert in this regard. You handle Britannia so you're going to be expert. Well, you are the expert on head canon on Ask Britannia so I guess that's why Norman is using the term head canon expert. <laughs> well, yes. The thing is, I think it's one of those one of those aspects of when you're coming to writing what is essentially overblown fan fiction, or indeed just fan fiction full stop, is that when we're coming up with our own take on what the show is, we do have to sort of set in stone in our own little worlds how things work. It's all about world building as a writer. The fact that I'm doing so about a about a show which is still still ongoing. And it's still throwing little things out for us. We're tr- still trying to learn about what exactly makes up this world and uh, and what the setting is. I mean, it's it's true. What we've what we have been given is yes, a candy coloured, but it feels like there's a deep mythology going on within there, or at least there's an extensive mythology. Whether it's particularly deep or not is uh, is to be you know argued. Mm, okay. um, but. As far as expert goes, we all try and build our own appreciation for what the show is. We all want to learn things about, I mean, the, the clamour to find out more about Luna and Celestia's uh, backstory. And without much from the show going off on it, we try and come up with our own. And so you get so many varied fanfics and takes. I mean, you get the whole, you know, in part it's out. Of, it, it's just out of fun, but there's also a certain amount of, you know, not serious business, but a certain amount of actual time taken to try and work out what's going on. I mean, you've got the the, the new Lunar Republic and the <laughs> Solar Empire aspects to it. Right. And until recently, it's uh, a case uh, it becomes a case of well, was Luna justified in what she did, or was you know was Celestia a real tyrant? And mm. it's asking these kind of questions that ends up building up what you consider to be your headcanon, your take on what the world is. Okay. So, but Hazel, before we move on, uh, could you explain to us what is headcanon? Headcanon yes. is... Did I hear you say that Hazel is the expert on headcanon at Ask Britannia? Because I think you might be misdirecting some of your praise there. It's I think... So after all. You know, Norman, I think you don't... That's not a word! ...it up. <laughs> I'm sorry, Claria. Uh, you, you know, Hazel told me stuff, and I thought he was the expert, not you. I don't know. So, uh, so well, I think we'll be. Uh, I think we'll be exchanging some words about this at a bug. <laughs> I never said anything about me being an expert in any much as anyone who has an opinion Every- about the show, is an expert. <laughs> Everybody is in trouble in this podcast but me, because I'm smart enough to not open my mouth when Clarion is around. <laughs> you were just shifting the blame. 
I'm not shifting the blame, Claudio. Come on. I said it was your one who did. How could you tell How very human. <laughs> Oh my. Also, I'm, I'm throwing you a picture, Clarion, so you're going to be fun. <laughs> you're going to be fun. In answer to your question, Norman, a headcanon is quite simply your own personal take on how you think the world or certain aspects of the characterization or certain aspects of the show itself work where it hasn't been fully explained. Um, admittedly, within like a 20-minute run of, a, sh- of uh, a particular episode of MLP, it'll bring up things that, you know, they may be thrown away in a joke or it might be just a little bit of exposition to try and explain something away. But when you're trying to build an idea of a fully cohesive world, um, you've got to try and find some explanation for those sorts of things that don't fit or indeed try and string certain things together. I mean, the er example in this show is how on earth do Luna and Celestia work within the context. I mean, um, Sketchy's explored a lot of this in his fanfics. Um, I've tried to explore explore it a certain amount in Aspritania and certainly in trying to build up the world behind it because there's a lot of Equestria that really doesn't make any sense and then there's a lot of it that tries to come to some semblance of sense. So when you're trying to mm-hmm. write a fanfic or when you're trying to write an ex- a, a build into the dive into these parts that aren't shown on the show or a kind of made up on the spot by the writers, it almost seems. <laughs> You're trying to find an excuse for it. You're trying to make it work. Mm, I see. And so headcanning is kind of the way that writers and um, fanfic writers and, you know, comic writers try and find a way around it. So, mm. yeah. All right. I, I would love to have your advice on something that seems to affect... Almost all of the fandom, when a new episode comes out, uh, how should people react when a new episode is released and it takes their head cannon and turns them into smithereens? Speaking from personal experience, um, I think a good way that you should handle that is just to keep calm and brony on. <laughs> the best way of it, handling it, in my experience, would be to... First of all, don't panic is the best bit of advice there. Because just because something in the show has contradicted something you have written doesn't mean it's the end of the world. I mean, this is the thing. I, I can speak from personal experience on it as well because this, I, although I haven't really had any of my headcan obliterated, thank God, um, I, had, I did nevertheless, I was on tenterhooks when we had uh, Lunar Eclipse was coming out. Because Luna is a fairly prominent character in oh. stories written, or reasonably prominent anyway, and I was like, "Oh gosh, you know, is the way they're going to portray her here? Is it going to completely contradict what I've written about her?" Uh, long story short, no, it didn't. Um, in fact, it only served to reinforce some of it. I mean, the way I write Luna is as someone who is fairly serious most of the time, but certainly has the capacity for being a prankster and being a bit silly and childish sometimes. Mm-hmm. And Luna definitely showed that she has got that in that episode. So thankfully in my case, it reinforced what I'd written. Um, but I know in Hazel's case, uh, his idea for how Daring Do was, was that Daring Do is actually, you know, was pretty much just a fictional character and was stuff being... Uh, it, it was basically an autobiography being written by someone else and with a lot of embellishments made, mm-hmm. essentially. Um, whereas, of course, as we know, the, the, the show has now completely gone and uh, smashed Nat to pieces. But I'm sure Hazel could tell you how he's dealing with that. Oh, yeah. I mean, at the time, I've, I've, me and James and I and Sketchy have talked about how I did not particularly care that much for Daring Don't. Yeah. Um, in mm-hmm. terms of how I felt that it impacted the way that the world was created. Um, at the same time, um, I'm not saying this to sort of bash anybody's particular feelings of that episode, or indeed the feeling that the, the, the way that the world was presented through the episode. Because that's the thing about headcanon, it's, it's pretty much like any other opinion. Everyone's obligated, uh, obligated to have one, but you're also obliged to completely ignore it on occasion. <laughs> and I, I do, I do encourage people not to take mine into a, uh, not to use anything that I or anyone else has written in, in terms of, Headcanning as to to 
particularly serious. It's just bands trying to find a way around the shortfalls of, you know, the storytelling in the show. The thing about headcanons is, as, as Hazel said, they are essentially opinions. And the classic, opin- the classic quote about opinions is that they're like butts. <laughs> Everyone has got one and they all smell. <laughs> yeah, and if you don't use them, then you will end up getting drowned in your own... That's- Word? So, <laughs> yes. yeah. Okay. But yeah. here's the thing: like we, you, men- you guys mentioned a lot about fan fiction. So, what is the difference between head cannons and fan fictions? Like, isn't fan fiction something you write about, and head cannon is just something you think in your head and you discuss with people? I think that in that strip, they're kind of linked together because someone who is writing fan fiction, fiction based on, you know, as a fan, writing fiction based on a world that has already been set in, you know, has already been set but hasn't necessarily been fleshed out entirely, you're going to have to encounter the difficult questions that every writer does when they're writing it. It's like, for example, um, here's a headcanon, Applejack's parents. Um, if you were, say, writing a fanfic and it was about... AJ's um, AJ's parents, and or it was about AJ and her life on Sweet Apple Eaters with her siblings, and the point came up about you know parents. Well, we kind the family we kind of assume via word of God and via speculation that her parents are dead. Yeah. Um, but that's never been confirmed in the show. Nothing has ever been said about it. For all we know, they're off traveling, or that it's- they, uh, or you know. It's kind of hinted at, but it's never explicitly said so. Exactly. So it's one of those things where that's where headcanon comes into it. If you personally decide that, right, AJ's parents, for all intents and purposes, as far as this fic are concerned, are dead. So I'm Mm. going to write as if that is a fact that has happened. Mm. You have to take this into account, otherwise you might have characters saying the sort of things that, wait, if her parents are dead, wouldn't she find that insensitive? Or wouldn't she react to that in some way? Or why isn't she reacting to that? Because that's the way that characterization works. Mm -hmm. That's it in terms of fan fiction. If, however, you might not, if you are a, uh, not a fanfic writer or you're not even any, anywhere connected to fanfic, you just like watching the show, at the same time, there will be those kind of questions that pop up that you've got to think to yourself, well, it's never been actually said in the show, but based on all these little things that have been said in the show, I kind of come to the conclusion that it's like this. It's like there's the assumption that Celestia and Luna are immortal. We don't know that. Mm -hmm. No one has ever said that they are immortal. They've been around for a long time, yes, but, you know, for all, we don't know whether they can, they will eventually die. Maybe living for a very long age is just normal for alicorns. Until season two, we thought that they were the only alicorns. And, you know, any amount of arguing came about after (laughs) that when, when Cadence turned up, and then especially so after Twilight. You know, for all we know, there are loads of them and nothing has ever been said in the show. Um, so I suppose that's where the difference between headcanon and fan fiction is. Fan fiction writers utilize their own personal headcanons or headcanons they share with other people alongside show canon to try and build and flesh out their world. But everyone who enjoys the show has a degree of headcanon going on, even if it's just quite simply the case that, uh, say, for example, Twilight Sparkle's an only child. But mm. then, of course, season two comes along and we find <laughs> out that she isn't an only child. Uh, <laughs> it can crush. I, I, know, I know you are going... To, I know what you're going to answer already, but I really need to ask you this so we can have you saying this. Okay. What do you think of people judging the TV show according to how much their headcanon is or is not approved? It's a really stupid I... thing to do, <laughs> is what I think. Um, I would say... if. If you know, if just because the show does something that contradicts what your ideas are, that's no reason to get upset by it. If you're going to, if you're going to judge something that you watch and that you enjoy based on how closely it sticks to your perceptions of it, then that's really not a good idea. Because the thing you have to understand is that the show is written by other people. And those other people who are writing it, they're going to have their own idea of how things go. And the only difference between how you want things to go and how they things want to go is that they're the ones holding the pen. <laughs> so the one, the one thing that always upsets me is that there is always a contingent of people coming at the TV show every Saturday, and they say, "Yeah, I don't like it. They should have done it like this." And I'm like, "But you're not the one writing. You're not judging the show for what you just see. 
you are judging the show because of what you wanted to see and because it wasn't there, you're throwing in your opinion, wishing it was real. Mm. See, here's the thing I would say is if you got an opinion like that, if you think that they should have done it a different way, rather than whining and bitching about it on the internet, which is completely unhealthy and doesn't achieve anything other than pissing off a lot of people, if you think a, a, a particular episode or whatever should have gone a certain way and you would have liked it better going a certain way, why don't you just put your money where your mouth is and write a story where it does go that way? Because hmm. if you have such a good idea of how it should go, why don't you write it that way? Yeah, and you know what? Even better, not only write it that way, but take it to Hasbro and see if they want to give you their money in mm. order to produce a TV show mm. so you can have your episode done. And you know what you will end up with? You will end up with Double Rainbow. <laughs> oh, and we all know how that one ended up. Uh, but honestly, I do like the concept idea. And you know what? If you like the story in your head that how this should happen... Create your own story, create your own scenario, create your own fanfic where this is how I think it should happen and here is the story and you retell the story. And James, I'm glad you brought this up because you and me had this talk before when we were reviewing an episode. You said that this is how I felt it should have happened, but this is me putting my opinion on the story and not judging it for what it is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I have said that so many mm. times, it's not even funny anymore. Yeah. But you know what? I, I do have this conversation with a friend for another show where we discuss that, oh, it would be a good idea if they ran it this way and we discuss of, oh, because of certain things, they couldn't do that, but it would be fun if they do this. So where do you put a full stop on putting your own spin on things and just discussing with another friend about the matter? Um, well, just to get back to uh, what um, what James was bringing up about what, how people should cope with it, um, to a degree, I'm going to say that we're all in the, we all get invested to different degrees and for different reasons in the show. I mean, there's any amount of people who were probably fully on board with the original premise of the show, but then one particular story-changing aspect somehow ruins the feel for them. And they're obliged to do so. We all appreciate different things from our fiction. Some people are able to relax and there's enough enjoyment within the show itself to continue enjoying it in the way that they always have done. And other people, it really is almost like a game-breaker for them. I wonder how many bronies jump, jump ship from considering themselves part of the fandom for instance, when um, Princess Alicorn Twilight Sparkle came along, or even earlier. More than half of it. <laughs> you know, oh, I doubt it was that big, to be honest. But <laughs> it's, you know, it's one of those where I'm not going to get anyone for having an opinion or having a feeling, because there's no point in watching the show if you no longer enjoy it. It's just, you know, move on. Don't complain too much to people who do enjoy it or don't have an issue with your, fa- with your opinion and find something new to do or find some sort of creative uh, vent for your, uh, for your frustrations. Like Sketchy said, like writing a, your own fic or, you know, work or just talking with it with like-minded people. Um, the thing is you shouldn't get, it is very un- inadvisable to get too attached to what you're doing because in life it, as well, because something will come along that will potentially change things for you and you know getting worked up about a kids tv show is kind of like lowest on the priorities in that <laughs> regard really yeah, it's just that, how adaptable you are really mm. yeah in the, you know what let me add something to that because it doesn't mean that you had you don't have to be you cannot be attached to something because in that case what's the point of living you, you can be attached to something as much as you want but you need to know and you need to you have to learn how to move on from that like when you have something and you are enjoying that something and suddenly you stop enjoying it, you have to get out of there. You have to get away from it instead of staying and ruining the fun for all the people who are still enjoying it. Because mm-hmm. like, if, yeah. Yeah, if you are, that's just being vindictive. That is just being a, you're just being a butthole about the whole thing. And it's not... Yeah. It's mm. it's not productive, and yes, yeah, sometimes it's nice to rant, and sometimes we do have those subjects that are just we we enjoy having a good gripe about. I mean, currently we're having a good gripe about people who do certain things, but at the yeah, same exactly. time, it's just almost a case of look for the be- the sake of everybody, just just 
leave it alone. Go away. <laughs> Go away. Yeah. No, no, but it really is because it, it's better for you, for everybody, to just step away rather than staying and do the same thing you were doing but badly and angry and, like, apathetic and saying, oh, God, I hate this so much. I don't want to keep doing this. But I'm still doing it. Why? <laughs> because. Mm. Oh, okay. You, you know, you guys mentioning about fanfics and how it destroy your head cannons. I had a story idea for Daring Do. And I think I told this more than once, but you know what? I'm just going to tell it because it's my show and I can do whatever I want to. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the story idea is basically like this. Rainbow Dash found out that they're making a Daring Do movie in Ponyville, tells Twilight about it, and Rainbow Dash gets hyped and wants to meet the actress who plays Daring Do. Um, in her mind... That character or the actress who's playing Daring Do is very outgoing, very like Daring Do. But once she meets her, that character is actually very shy, almost to a degree of flutter shy, but not that bad. So now Rainbow Dash has to figure out, how do I feel about this? That's how Rainbow Dash is going through. But with the recent season for episode Daring Don't, yeah, the idea went out the window. I would not necessarily the idea, say the idea goes out of the window because that story itself still has quite engageable relevance to a reader. You might read into that and, yeah, coming to terms with the fact that your expectations of how a character is going to be to, or how a person is going to be is going to be at complete, complete odds with how they actually are. And that's actually kind of meta-ironic when you consider that we're having a discussion about the fact that Daring Do didn't turn out to be how we might necessarily <laughs> think they are. Um, if we are going to share our head cannons, may I share one that I had? That, oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I, I had one, one head cannon that could be divided in, like, several, but I did it just because of... That's not a word! ...and giggles, because personally, I don't, I don't care too much about head cannons. I just sit down and I enjoy the, the, the TV show for what it is, than mm. trying to think on hidden meanings or subtext or anything. Yeah. Oh, that's, so, okay. that's meta -nar that's narrative critique. That's, uh, that's a different thing entirely, but go on, James. Okay, <laughs> so, um, in in, in my head canon, I, I always thought that Twilight was the reincarnation of Starshield the Bearded. Ooh. In that uh, she has she has a high, a big con connection with him. Uh, she completed the spell uh, on the on that on that notebook. She dressed as him in the Canterlot uh, in the, in the Nightmare Night. She was the only one who managed to make the time traveling spell work on the library. And she has a high interest on anything that has to do with him. Also, she played the, as his assistant in mm -hmm. the Hearth Swarming Eve play. So I thought maybe there is something going on here between Twilight and Starshell that we don't know yet. You know, I do like that hit canon because it adds a level of inception, if you may, of this is interesting. I like this idea. It won't be real, but I do like the idea. I, I, I actually I just remember I had another one, but continue, Hazel, you were going to say something. I was going to say that, well, unless we get some sort of idea that um, that reincarnation actually exists in Equestria or an ML MLP, we're not exactly going to get a confirmation of this. I mean, the way that I see it is it is quite simply a case of Twilight Sparkle is a lot like what she perceives you know, Star Swirl to be like. She's very studious. She's also very interested in magic. And, of course, she'd be interested in a, a famous unicorn from way, way back who was, like, the renowned as one of the most, the, one of the most important figures in magical research and, you know, and stuff like that. So, me personally, I wouldn't read anything deeper into it other than that. But there does seem to be a lot of there's a lot made of this Star Swirl the bearded figure. The amount of head cannons I've seen of that, like maybe Star Swirl is actually Discord, or maybe Star Swirl <laughs> is Sombra, yes. and all this, that, and the other, and they're all very appealing. They're all the sort of things where I could get on board with that as an idea, even though it's not likely to be real. Hmm. And that's the thing. There's a there are a, there are almost like two levels of head cannon you need to take into account. One is speculative. It's what you think might happen or what you think the story is trying to get at. Um, you know, a good example would be looking at, for example, in the, re in the recent season, they've got all these rainbow, uh, the rainbow motif going on all the downtime. Now, if we did yeah. not know that it was inextricably linked to Hasbro's Rainbow Power Toy series, 
you know, speculating about what there will be would be in the realms of headcanon. But I think we already kind of know what's going to happen. We're just going to get to the point where they're going to reach the next level of Super Saiyan and then they're all going to turn into, you know, it's all going to be magical rainbow stuff going on. All right. um, now, that's speculative headcanon. The other kind of headcanon is just trying to make sense of the world we're presented with because at the same time we've got, you know, it's a magical world run by, you know, run by ponies. <laughs> We've got Celestia and Luna who control the sun and the moon. Now, is the world... Is it a, a geocentric universe then? Is it like the sun and the moon rotate, uh, orbit the Earth? Or is the, the planet they're on orbiting the sun? Or, you know, you've got... That kind of headcanon is where you're trying to actually almost set physical rules in place. Mm-hmm. And that's the kind of stuff that is more useful for writers. Because it, it yeah. gives it a length of... It, it means that when you're writing the world, you've got to take into account consistency. You can't present a threat to your characters that is oh so big and dramatic one moment, and then in the very next chapter, you come up with something just on the fly that could have actually solved this problem <laughs> ages back. Even the show falls into that sort of trap so mm. many times, you know, and right. why they yeah. sort of fit to get rid of the elements of harmony, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that you go, in that case, my, my, the, the headcanons that I have, they do uh, count as, like, uh, the, the first type. The one that you are like, oh, yeah. maybe, yeah, speculative head cannons. The other ones, I don't even bother using. <laughs> because mm-hmm. I am like, okay, this is a world of fantasy and wonder and complete and utter nonsense. I think I'm going to break my head trying to figure out the formula to why Rainbow Dash doesn't break all of her bones in her body when she pulls off a sonic rainbow. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, but, that, that, that will be, like you said, it's very, it's much more useful to writers, but for people who just watch the show, watch the show for what it is, it, doesn't it doesn't hold up at, at least in my from my perspective to a certain degree though it's one of those aspects where you know it's it's a thing that we ha- encounter in all fiction and you <coughs> as a as a movie buff yourself um james you have to recognize the idea of the will the willing suspension of disbelief <laughs> yeah why it is that you're perfectly content to watch say a sci-fi movie with you know spaceships and you know, aliens and all these fantastical things that you don't encounter in real life, but then something will come along that just makes absolutely no sense to you, like a character who is supposed to be this, you know, this clever and resourceful person making a completely boneheaded move <laughs> and no one points it out. Mm. It's like a case of, well, there's no, it's a, it's a show about, it's a show about aliens and flying in space. That's not real. It's like, yeah, but we know what human nature is. We know how people act. So if That's this person exactly is acting in a believable fashion, then it feels off to us. Mm. That's exactly yeah. yeah. That is, you know what? You got it. You absolutely got it. Because if they work your, if they work you into the, the suspension of disbelief, and they take your hand and they uh, take you into it slowly, that's much better than if they throw you in in, <laughs> in there and like ah, completely touch. Uh, detach you from reality. You you completely got it. I think it's just one of those... There's a difference, say, with space. An example of a space or a magical realm. We don't know the rules of this place. We can't apply our own rules. How do we know that pony bones aren't strong enough to be able to withstand being smashed continually into trees like, um, like Rainbow Dash seems to be doing every episode? Mm, okay. But at yeah. the same time, you know, if we were to apply that logic to this world, yeah. It makes no sense because we know that doesn't happen. Mm. So, you know, oh. that's why you need superhero movies for <laughs> that kind of stuff. <laughs> See, uh, I, I do like um, your talk about the first hit canon. What was it? Speculative or? Yeah, speculative. Basically, yeah. where you're trying to guess at where the show is going. I mean, even with, say, Alicorn Princess Twilight Sparkle, mm. I would be. It would be very hard pushed for someone to say, I never saw that happening. Mm. I think it's one of those things where seeing Twilight progress to a point where she was... No, because her teacher was Princess Celestia. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the point of, you know, the point in these stories of the student is the student becoming the master, if you will. (laughs) The student progressing to that Mm. same level. Okay. And she's supposed yeah. to be the most magical unicorn who's ever lived or is around at the time. So, yeah, her, um, her, you know. Yeah, I completely agree with you because I think it was Lauren Faust who said that Twilight was going to end up becoming Celestia's successor in the end. 
Mm. And there has been so, there were so many people complaining that uh, when Twilight turned into an Alicorn, people complained that Lauren Faust would have never done something like this. I think Alicorn Twilight would have happened with or without Lauren Faust. Sooner or later, she would have been transformed. And there was going to be people complaining about it, mm. re- I- I- regardless of what happened in the end. Mm. In, I think I don't, it, it might have happened in a different fashion. It might have been different. Mm-hmm. But you know what? No matter how it ha- happened, it's change. And by mm-hmm. human nature, by nature, people don't like change. Mm. Yes. True that. Yes. But on to what I was about to say, um, mm-hmm. I do like the scientific explanation for hit cannons. Like, how do ponies pick up stuff with their hooves? It doesn't really make sense. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, and someone on the internet showed a video of this new technology where this thing uses air or compression, whatever, or the Tumblr picture. Yeah, of it's how- like it uses it uses suction in order yeah, to yeah. pick up really tiny objects. So they said, aha, that's how pony hooves work. I do like that kind of um, head cannon where, okay, this is how they do it. Show scientific fact. Like, okay, <laughs> you have a lot of time on your hand, dear sir. Essentially what we've got here then is headcanon is thinking way too deeply about a subject that does not necessarily require it. But for those kind of people who get a kick out of it or those kind of people who feel the need to do so... Or um, those people who have too much time in their hands... I'd say that both of them are kind of... Yeah. <laughs> um, then it's it's almost... It's it's just something that they they find enjoyment out of, or they you know they get into. I mean, another example, if we're using the horn, the the whole how do they carry things with their hooves thing. Another one I've read is that it's uh, they've got magic feet, or <laughs> no, or but to put it more to put it more uh, bluntly, they also use their tails for things, for oh. carrying things and moving. Yeah, things. look at and, Applejack. She uses her lasso with her tail. No. And then you've also got horns, uh, which are, you know, with unicorns are magical. Now, in quite a lot of animals, the horn is made out of the same kind of material as the nails or the hooves. And it's also made out of the same kind of material as your, as your hair. It's keratin. So maybe yeah. ponies have some sort of magical aspect to their keratin. I mean, feathers as well. Because there's no other way that pegasi should be able to fly. They have not got... They're not drawn as having the kind of musculature to be able to fly mm. i mean the other argument is it's a cartoon just <laughs> relax oh, and that's true. to be honest the, that's always going to be the big argument for everything yeah, but true, if you want true. to try and make some sense behind the world you know there's a there's a hypothesis maybe they've just got magic some sort of magic material that makes up their horns and their mm. tail and their fur and their um and so on. I mean, that, where does the cutie mark come from? It's only mm. in the coat, because we've seen episodes where they've, you know, they've been shaved and <laughs> there's no cutie mark on the skin. It's not a tattoo. So maybe, oh, they've, got, yeah, maybe is, they've got magical fur. <laughs> that, is, that is true, because it was in Ponyville Confidential that the uh, Snips and Snails, they have to shave their butts to <laughs> remove all the gum, and they don't have cutie marks under their fur. It, it, you're absolutely right. Oh, God, you're right. That's the thing about head cannoning. It's just trying to build some sense out of all these interconnected things to try and answer awkward questions. Mm. And, <laughs> and you know, I think it's human nature to have everything explained or have an explanation for everything because yeah. we as a human race cannot accept anything that doesn't have any explanation to it. We must explain it even if it's illogical or even if it's Logical. We must explain it. Yes. I mean, we're problem solvers. It's how we've managed to survive and also how we've managed to build the world around us and around, build our technology to the degree if it is. If, if it's an idea that doesn't make any sense, sooner or later it's going to reach a point where it no longer performs the task it has to. And in many ways, I suppose it could be argued that's what happens to people who find that they've lost faith with the show. Mm. It's the the show itself no longer answers the questions that they wanted to. Well, that explains a lot, and we as a human being do want to, you know, we do want things to explain to us. And James, you mentioned before earlier before you had another head cannon. What was it? Oh God, is there any point on talking about that? Because oh, sure. it's like, okay, you ah. explain yours and I explain mine. I'll talk about mine later <laughs> because we as human beings have a lot of head cannons. 
Uh, okay, well, no, but like I said before, just for just for the giggles and not really taking it seriously. Mm-hmm. Uh, my other head canon was that Queen Chrysalis, <laughs> the queen of the changelings from the Canterlot Wedding episodes, mm-hmm. she is actually the princess from the Hearts and Hoofs potion uh, mm. legend. Ah. This is one that's that, been uh, used a few times I've seen, so yeah. Yeah, so, you know, that, this is the first that, time for me. I think that is actually part of the premise of... Uh, Discordly conduct and Cupidite's efforts is that those yeah, are that a, a Tumblr about Discord and uh, mm. and Chris and Queen Chris. Oh, those yeah. two! That I love will, those two. Those are funny. It will make a lot of it will make a lot of sense because you have the princess taking the potion, going crazy with love. Then she gets corrupted and she gets uh, exiled or something. That she comes back. She's still obsessed with love and all all that thing. And I'm like, wow. Interesting. They also have the same writer. They are both written by Megan McCarthy. <laughs> and just an, a, a, as an addition, I'm pretty sure they have done this already, but the prince that appear on the legend, in that case, that prince will end up becoming King Sombra, mm-hmm. who moved to the north or northern side of Equestria, took over the Crystal Empire, and was obsessed with keeping the Crystal Heart under control. And how does, this, how does the Crystal Heart work? With the power of the love of the of the crystal ponies. Mm. Once again, those episodes were also written by Megan <laughs> McCarthy. I mm. like to I like to call the episodes Hearts and Hooves Day, A Canterlot Wedding, and The Crystal Empire the trilogy of love. <laughs> <laughs> I do like that concept, James. It is a really good idea, and it's a really good experiment for head cannon exercise. And talking about head cannon exercise. Hazel, you receive a bunch of head cannons every day for As Britannia, right? Uh, when we do them, yes. Um, I mean, this is the the thing. The head cannon within the show. It, that we're talking about mostly as a as an idea for as fans of the show in general. But mm-hmm. um, any sort of any sort of creative works which has gar- garnered the attention of the fan base is also quite um, open to the idea of having people headcanning about it. And, and As Britannia has got to that point now where it's presented certain questions and certain ideas and character concepts that I did what I've seen a lot of other blogs do, um, which is I, I open the floor out, hey, why don't you try and present... Why don't you present your ideas for what's going on or how people are acting or even just little aspects about each character and I will either confirm, deny or um, completely uh, escape the question entirely and see what you come up with. And there were quite a few that were quite interesting. Most of them are connected to the show itself because they're putting Ask Britannia into the context which I intended, which is it is the equestria that we all know and love, only we're seeing it from a more... You know, a more technical standpoint, point, mm-hmm. uh, the point of view of the background ponies, if you will. And, um, you know, we got some interesting ones about, uh, about uh, the way that Equestria rea- uh, acts to the world and the way that the princesses are. And um, it raised up some interesting questions that we had. Like, there was at one point where it was saying, well, how much influence does do Celestia and Luna have on the way the place is actually run? Um, this is because within our blog we have interaction with uh, members of the equestrian government and the secret mm. services and the like. And I'm thinking, well, are they a constitutional monarchy? Are they? Do they actually have any direct mm. involvement with the, you know, the inner workings, or are they there merely as figureheads? You know, very powerful figureheads. Um, how much are people elected? And these kind of questions, which are technically overthinking, if we're thinking of it in terms of the show. But within the blog itself, because we do have to deal with these kind of issues, we do have to kind of put a, you know, a concrete or at least a seemingly concrete answer on them. I mean, someone professed a que- uh, asked a question uh, with, um, wait, if Luna and Celestia control the sun in Equestria, doesn't that technically mean that Equestria runs the whole world? <laughs> and I'm thinking, I don't think Equestria does. And I don't think the princesses do, but I think that it's it's one of those it's one of those things that has basically meant that the the ponies are one of the more powerful parts of the world. It was really just a test to see how much of our fan base was actually paying attention, <laughs> and quite a lot of them weren't. And then another uh, a lot of them were paying far too much <laughs> attention. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of head cannons that dear Clarion has got as to her true identity has been uh, rather interesting. <laughs> I think it's the word for it. There have been so many different theories as to what might be the real identity behind this cute little sodgy pony head. The 
which brings everyone so many revelations day after day. Some are very close to the mark, some not so much. Some of them get quite a good giggle, it has to be said. Mm. Oh my... And but, some people will be more serious in the way that they actually approach the whole thing mm. because it's, uh, and some people will just um, be doing so for a laugh. Hmm. Okay, here, here's an interesting question for you. So when you ask people for their ideas about hit cannons and so on, how many percent of the time do you use those ideas as hit cannons or take their ideas into do, account? You mean, do you mean how often do we take those ideas and then actually work them into the blog? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, I think so far that has been 0% of the time. Oh, yeah. uh, However, there have been times which... Hazel, let me finish my yeah, point. No, I was going to say, um, we basically hardly ever use any ideas that have been sent in like that so far. There have been some good ideas that have come in, though. I'm not saying that we would never use any of them, but there have been some good ideas that have come in. Plus, there have also been times when people have sent in their headcan and it's actually been very close or spot on to what our uh, ideas and plans for things already are. So when we see stuff like that, it's good to see that from that we can, you know, we can see that our viewers are in fact paying attention to what we're doing. And in some cases, as Hazel said, sometimes they're paying far too much attention <laughs> and they're a lot more perceptive than we thought and have already guessed things uh, several steps ahead. <laughs> have you actually gotten you guys in trouble because of any of these headcanons? Like, oh, I'm upset because you're rebooting my headcanon. I'm going to do something bad to you. And then you're like, oh, God, no, please ignore. And then you have to block them. Um, oddly enough, <laughs> um, Sketchy, if you want to talk about this one, because there has been an anon on the blog proper who has, yeah. well, he's basically taken extreme umbrage to the fact that we have not solved the main narrative um, problem of our, you know, the main issue that needs to be overcome by our main characters um, by not getting the princesses to fix it for them. <laughs> And I admit it's one of those things where it was a trouble for myself because I had to think, well, how would Celestia and Luna, why would Celestia and Luna not fix this flooding issue that's affecting Cantalot? Because it should be within their capabilities to do so, surely. And I thought, well, maybe it is within their capabilities, but they're otherwise engaged. Or maybe yeah. this is just an issue that it isn't in any of their, you know, it isn't for them to fix because they don't have to fix it. They've got other ponies who can do it. Why yeah. would a ruler necessarily fix every single problem that occurs their way? If it's, it's like if you were, say, working in a business, and instead of you just getting on with your job, your manager came along and kept telling you how to do it for you. <laughs> it's like this isn't how you run a business, and it's certainly not how you run a country. So we came up with a, a, prob a reason why. We, the reasoning being that, look, the reason uh, that... Celestia and Luna aren't doing this is because they're otherwise engaged with diplomatic matters. They're having to converse with other people, with the sea ponies, <laughs> sorting out the fact <laughs> that Luna's come back. And Luna controls the moon, and the moon controls the tides. And the last time Luna was here, she went a little bit nuts. <laughs> so the sea ponies are, all, are a little bit concerned that, you know, there seems to be some new management of a key geological gravitational force in their world. And so Celestia and Luna are having to play nice for a bit to reassure them. And now this Wouldn't... issue's come about. So, yeah. I mean, Wouldn't that be awesome if that happened? <laughs> Essentially what has happened with it is that, as I say, there is, you know, there is this, just this one particular Anon, as, um, as Hazel said, who seems to be extremely enthusiastic about bombarding us with questions about this and that, that and the other. And the one thing that they keep doing is just hassling at, uh, us to keep, you know, to sort out the main issue of the narrative already. And it's like, look, you know... It's great that you're this enthusiastic about us, you know, getting on with things. It's great that you want to see how the story develops. But it's not so great that you're bombarding us every single day, hassling us to get on with it, because that just kind of makes us not want to. Because it's like, will you just shut up and let us get on with it? Goodness me. It's like, well, you, it's don't to, yeah. it's like you don't trust us to complete our own story the right way. Ah, gee, there's a thing, there's a thought. You know, I bet I know exactly how the writers of MLP feel now. 
<laughs> I was wondering about that because isn't this blog, Us Britannia, your idea, your baby, your idea? And while I was thinking that, wait, this is almost like how the show runners feel. Like, it's their <laughs> show, their baby, they know what they're doing. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, this is also the thing. We rely on the feedback of our followers in order to, in some ways, progress the narrative, um, but in, men- in other ways, just to comment upon it and in other ways to ask us questions. However, there is there's a genuine feeling when you when you're approaching this, you know, when this particular. You know, when we get this kind of feedback from people telling us to get on with it or, oh, he's taking too long, it's like you do realise that you're just prolonging it Mm -hmm. by bombarding us with this kind of questioning, aren't you? Because the more you push and push and push, the more we feel that we have to answer these questions that you're providing us with. Now, the counter-argument is, oh, well, you don't have to listen to them. And it's like, yeah, you're right, delete. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) And... But the reason why I, I mentioned this particular episode is because you asked Norman, you know, have we ever re- or was it yourself, James? Sorry, who asked, have we ever received hate? That was for me. Counteracting something, yeah. Um, they felt really umbridged at the fact that the, uh, that Celestia wasn't doing anything to actually solve the main crux of this narrative, and even though we'd given our answer for why, um, and from a narrative perspective. If you have a godlike character who has the potential to do something, you have to find some way of otherwise occupying them if you want to make the, you know, if you want to give any point behind your character, your own character's uh, trial that they have to overcome. But, you know, they really had a go, they really had a go at us for that, saying it was a major flaw of what, of what we were, uh, we were trying to present. And it just, in many ways, it's kind of crushing because it's one of those aspects of, look, you're just, impacting our own storytelling with your own interpretation of how these characters should be. We've given you our explanation. You're, you're basing your own opinion on the way you interpret the way the world should work, but it's not necessarily ours. Mm. We're the writers in this regard. You know, the way that Celestia and Luna operate here may not necessarily be how you think they're going to operate. You know, the way I've always thought of them is that they, they kind of occupy a very important role within the uh, within the running of the country but they don't do everything mm. you know i mean there's so many issues where they you know the the point of the story has left <laughs> the saving of the world in the hands of six sem- you know or probably teenage characters oh. you know it makes sense within a story but it doesn't make any sense at all if we're talking about it as being an actual cohesive world so mm. we kind of have to justify why that makes sense Right. You know, aside from there, the magical elements of harmony. Oh, yeah, um, that's true, that's true. And this also reminds me of what James said earlier about you shouldn't insert your own headcanons into other people's story and push those headcanons as how you perceive it. On the good side of this, though, there is also opportunity for people to come to agreement and for what would be termed a shared universe to come about from it. Sketchy and I are good examples. Well, we're examples of this. Whether we're good or bad is up <laughs> the opinion of the viewers. But I had my own interpretation for how Equestria worked, and Sketchy had his. And then when we started collabing together and writing our characters together, we had to get into discussions about how certain things worked. Sketchy had already come up with ideas behind how Celestia's guards operated, and I'd come up with ideas behind how how I thought that they operated. And so we came to a compromise in some cases, or we came into agreement in other ways. That's the positive side (laughs) of Ed Cannon, because to look at it negatively, you'd think, God, why would you guys even bother? It sounds so tedious. But the good thing is we like doing it because it means that we can come to these sort of shared suggestions and build upon these ideas for even, you know, even more interesting creative endeavours. I have just noticed something Beth mentioned there. Um, and, yeah, this does bear mentioning. There was there was one other person who we also ended up having... We actually ended up having to block this person for a bit. I'm not going to say exactly who it was. Um, but uh, there was one guy who went ahead at one point and uh, the stuff he's been writing, the character he'd been writing, was hilariously Mary Sue. Nothing wrong with that in and of itself, except on the page he'd written about his character on one of the wikis out there that's for putting characters on, he'd then gone ahead and associated that character with Britannia, 
without asking us whether or not that was okay. And he'd also written himself into events of our blog, with, also without asking us whether or not that was okay. Um, wow. And I noticed this because, you know, he'd gotten in touch with us and said a few things. And I was like... You did not ask whether you could do this or not. You just went ahead and did it and wrote yourself into events here. And I was like, that's... I said, I'm frankly disgusted with that. And I was like, and I'm going to kindly request that you completely remove any reference to Britannia from your works because you didn't ask at all whether or not you could do this. And more to the point, the kind of thing that you're doing is not something we would want our character associated with. I didn't say this exactly to him, but the gist of what I said to him was, what you're doing is really... So we'd rather you don't associate our character with this because we, we frankly are better writers than you. That wasn't exactly what I said to him. But it was, <laughs> um, and uh, this guy, he also, he, he was kind of sort of um, hassling a lot of us on, uh, on film fiction and DeviantArt and other places for a bit. And uh, we, we did have to block him from submitting questions to the Tumblr for a bit, and I also had to block him on DeviantArt for a bit, because the guy just... I don't know what it is. I think maybe it's because of cultural differences or language barriers or something, because I know that he's not someone from... Um, he's not someone from a, a part of the Western world. He's someone from uh, somewhere overseas, I forget exactly where, but basically there are a lot of cultural differences, and I think maybe he just wasn't really getting the fact that I was trying to tell him to... That's not a word! So I did end up having to block him for a bit. Um, he's since been unblocked, though, and he's not been so bad. I think he's learned his lesson, but yeah. There was this one guy who was just... You know, initially some of the ideas he'd had maybe weren't too bad, but then he would kept trying to push them on us. It's like, okay, no. It's like, we might have been open to the idea of having a little bit of collaboration with you here and there before, but the fact that you're just trying to not so much put your foot in the door as kick the door down, <laughs> it's really off-putting. And, you know, frankly, you can go take a running jump. Um, so, yeah, it, uh, it was really annoying. But um, thankfully, we've had very few dealings with him since, and he's been far less of a problem. Mm, okay. And James? Yeah, I was just going to say, to uh, shut down the, 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 the topic on headcanons and everything. Guys, you cannot forget that we are basically watching and enjoying one giant headcanon. If you remember, Lauren Faust didn't watch the original Generation 1 of My Little Pony. She watched a couple of episodes and she didn't like it. Instead, what she did was she bought the toys and she recreated her own stories. And she kept those stories for herself until Hasbro asked her to make a new show of MLP. So she brought these stories back and she created what we know now as Generation 4 based on the characters that she played with in Generation 1. So all of this, this whole thing, this show is one giant fanfic that got funded by Hasbro and approved and that everybody loved. Mm -hmm. you, you, you shouldn't get overly worked up because your headcanon doesn't get approved. In fact, you know what? You should keep it for yourself. You should preserve it because who knows? Maybe in the future you become a super awesome graphic designer or animator or writer and Hasbro approaches you and they say, hey, we want to work on Generation 8 of MLP. What do you have to offer? <laughs> you can offer them your stories. It's, just, it's a way of seeing it. You shouldn't get worked up because your head cannon gets trampled, destroyed, broken, shattered into smithereens. It's like, don't get mad. Enjoy the show for what it is. Mm -hmm. I think just use the show. It, the show is, in a sense, it's being a jumping off point for your own creativity. Nothing in the show gave you these ideas for how ponies might work things with their who's or for how the world operates or what would happen, for example, if we found out that uh, Chrysalis was, you know, was once the, the queen of the flutter ponies or something and then she drank a yeah. uh, love poison and became uh, the, the, the first ever changeling or anything. That was all you or it was all the work of the fandom that has grown up around it. Nothing has ever been set in stone. So whenever the show comes along and reminds you quite forthrightly that this is not necessarily a show geared up exclusively for you, 
but is being written by other human beings who have their own ideas of how the world should work, uh, how the their what their writing should work, and what would be appealing to you know the audience to which they're writing towards. You know, take heart with the fact that look, you've come up with something you enjoy. Why don't you try writing it and see what other people enjoy about it? And then, so many years down the line, when you no longer feel the need to write about a fictional setting come up with by someone else, you can write your own fictional setting and take what you have learned from this process to create, you know, to create your own world that other people can write headcanons about and get (laughs) angry that you didn't do the thing right that you should have done. (laughs) You should be, you should be thankful as a fandom for what you have. Do you have any idea how difficult it is to write a Game of Thrones fanfic? Oh, God. Like, like uh, uh, George R.R. Martin has actually made a point to go online and eliminate every single work of fanfiction that has anything to do with his stories. Because he says, if people are creative enough to come up with stories based on my universe, they are creative enough to, cre- to come up with stories with, with, their, with their own universes. Mm. So, guys... It's like, when you get angry because your head cannon gets destroyed, you are not just being stupid and flippant and angry and unfair, but you're also being incredibly, incredibly unthankful. Mm. Uh, ungrateful would be the word. Yeah. And with that, let's end it on a good note. Um, five, ten years from now, follow Equestria, canon. <laughs> 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 Official crossover game with Bethesda Studios. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> but anyway, I uh, play it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, DLC thanks. released. <laughs> yes, featured as a playable character. Uh, I got no idea. <laughs> you, you cannot play as a toaster. You cannot, sorry. <laughs> uh, boys. As but, I have so much toast inside me. Find out just how much of a toaster I am. Big. <laughs> It'll be you that I will toast. <laughs> ah, well, at least we're going to see a fight between Sweetie Bot and James. You know what they say, all toasters, toast, toast. <laughs> but anyway, thank you, Hazel. Thank you, Sketchy, for coming on the show and discussing about head cannons. No problem. <laughs> Not a problem. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if it's clarified anything for anyone, but we did manage to discuss a lot of things. True so. indeed, true indeed. And it it was, was definitely fun. Yeah, it was definitely fun talking and explaining. And you know what? Sometimes people may ignore it, but you know, it's all fun. It's all it's all in good fun. It's all in good fun. And that's what headcanons are at the end of the day. It's just trying to get some extra enjoyment out of this setting that we've grown so passionate about. Yeah, people draw fun art, people make remixes, other people do uh, PMBs, others decide to create their own head cannons. It's another way of enjoying the show that you are such a big fan of. That is true, that is true. Just don't be an ass about it! <laughs> <laughs> Boys. But anyway, let's move on to the next topic. And the next topic is letter time! Letter time! Yes, we got letters! Yay! Just one. Wait, wait, people write to us? It was... Month? Yeah, this one was a while back. I, I got derpy and I forgot to put it in the show notes. But yeah, th- this one. So, oh man, I am really bad. And we have a good voice actor here. So, Sketchy, why, why did you read this one? Oh, did you mean you wanted Sweetie Bot to read it? Oh, well, sure, why not? Sweetie Bot. I, I guess Sketchy's tied up right now, eh? <laughs> okay. Well, in today's letter time, we have a letter that says, Hey, guys. I'm just writing to let you know how much I love your show, especially now that James Cork, sorry for my bad spelling, is a regular co-host. Well, there's no accounting for taste, I guess. I think you all have great personalities, and I love listening to you playing off each other and talking about our favorite colorful egg wines. Keep up the good work. P.S. Rarity is best pony. Well, at least we agree there. B.P.S. Sorry if this email seems pointless. I just thought you deserved some love. Yours, Equinus. You know, that, that, that part about James Cork is a typo. It meant to say sketchy sounds. <laughs> 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 but, but honestly, thank you, Equi- uh, Equinus? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Equinus, for the email. And you know what? We do this episode every week just because of people like you who enjoy the show and listen to me and James talk, and especially uh, for James raging on about the fandom and so on. 
I don't know who the hell enjoys hearing me talk. I have a terrible accent and I make emphasis in too many of the letters. Well, James, you have 20 viewers on your live stream right now and I'm sure all of them love you. I'm pretty sure they were looking for Kevin Sanos' stream but they misstepped into another one. <laughs> Come on, your accent is not terrible at all. Your accent is fine. Mm. You, you, you want up, Miss Veld. You have a very awesome accent. My accent is, my accent is not Good, it's funny. You like my accent because it sounds hilarious. I, at least I think. I don't know. I'm not Are a funny you? guy. Well, that is what? not the not all. Your, you know, your accent is interesting because, you know, it is not the norm. It is, it is what some would call exotic. So, you know, it's <laughs> not the end of it, okay? <laughs> I'm going to cry in the corner now. I'm sorry. <laughs> See, even your lines are saying, James, your accent is cute. <laughs> no, you lions, my accent is not cute, don't say that! <laughs> ah, you're making me blush! But anyway, guys, so if you want your letters to be read on the show by me, James, or even Sweetie Bot, just send them to us and we'll read it out. So anyway, moving on to the next topic of shoutouts. So my shoutout goes to you, James, thank you for hosting us on your stream and um, wow. thank you, Hazel, for coming on. And thank you, Sketchy, for coming on. And thank you, CDBot, for doing all the hard work. Oh, I finally got some thanks. <laughs> yes, you deserve it, Sweetie. Yeah, I know. It's like, this is the first time you, the first time you like, give a shout-out to poor SweetieBot. <laughs> yes, and yes. I'm pretty sure there is some robot union somewhere that <laughs> is looking forward to <laughs> have SweetieBot with them. Oh, boys. But anyway, James, your shout-out... My shout-out goes to you, Norman, for bringing me in every week and instantly regretting when you have to to censor all of my swearing. Oh, no, that's Sweetie's job, not me. <laughs> uh, of course, I'm going to give a shout-out to Sweetie, but because, yeah. oh, poor Sweetie, always getting worked out because of my swearing. Uh, sorry, Sweetie. <laughs> no, how much work you give me each week. Uh, I give you work. In this recession, I'm actually giving you something to do. <laughs> You should be happy. And this is on should be, I suppose. <laughs> I also want to give a shout out to my good friend Ace, who's taking a break now because he's too burnt out from uh, all things pony and all things brony, so he's taking a break at the moment. Uh, I want to give a shout out to all my, the people on my stream. Lovely people, lovely viewers. And of course, last but not least, Hazel, Sketchy, you guys, thank you for coming on. Oh, it's not a problem. I like coming on here. And Hazel, what about you? Shoutouts? Shoutouts to all the followers of Aspirisania who might be popping in, and uh, shoutouts to the team who might be listening in. I know that uh, I know that at least one of you usually does. Hey, Beth, that would be the extent to it. Just and anyone else who wants a shout out, you can have one. I, I am shouting you out. This is this is a proxy of you being shouted out. <laughs> yeah, it's at me here. <laughs> and Sketchy, what about you? Yo, I would like to give a shout out to all the bronies in the house. Yo, you are you people are marvelous. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to give a shout out to the Aspertania team. You go, you guys are awesome, doing the stuff every week and doing the things. Yo, and oh, finally, the shout out to all them people listening in to the MBS show and those people on the stream right now. You are marvelous. Thank you all for listening in. Peace. Is that enough don't to be you, a kidna impression there? Don't you <laughs> do that again, for the love of God. <laughs> sketchy, I have sketchy, never been so, so offended. I have never been so offended since I watched Transformers 2. What the hell? <laughs> oh god. And I oh think... my god. <laughs> what is uh, Wow. And I wow. Think on that note, we can end this. I have a Norman Sanzo. Sketchy, were you painting your face black as well or something? <laughs> 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 Good lord! Uh, oh, boys! Oh, man! I have been very offended! <laughs> uh. <laughs> I'm speechless! <laughs> Thank you all very much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Yeah, yeah, we will see you guys next week, maybe with a lot more, a lot less of this. Uh, bye bye! <laughs>
real no nothing Except bringing about an orchard's destruction No, wait just a minute There's another side to this And if I did not defend them Then I would be the miss In fact, our mamas and papas too They care for the young just like we ponies do Oh, give me a break You're being too kind These creatures have a one-track mind The orchard is not their restaurant But do they ever think what others may want? No, they don't Yo. <laughs> <laughs> that was insulting. Oh, yeah, you're gonna go do that. Go on the way. <laughs> and that was the last episode of MBS Show. We hope you've enjoyed yourselves. <laughs> I'm going to have to do so much editing. <laughs> oh, keep hey, you started it, Sketch. <laughs> Well, why is that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, we're just recording now.